voice of my three-year-old echoed through the house into the kitchen where I got ready for the Independence Day picnic. The cheer in his voice warmed my heart as well as caused chills to shoot through my body. It was our third Independence Day celebration together, the first without his dad. Somehow, it hurt me more that he couldn't remember his dad was gone than it would have if we were mourning him together. My husband, Steve, died a few months ago in a car accident. It was the most devastating thing that ever happened to me. It was a simple trip from home to his office, but he never made it back home. The driver of the trailer that caused the accident was punished, but that didn't matter. It didn't bring back my Steve. Brian, our son, was all I had. Steve and I got married about five years ago. I was only 23 years old. However, we had issues with giving birth. No matter what we did, I couldn't conceive, and it was quite sad. Steve and I tried for a child over and over when we got married. We couldn't figure out what was wrong. Finally, two years after our marriage, I got pregnant and gave birth to Brian, a bright boy with blonde hair like his dad's. Of course, he was the pride of the house, coupled with the fact that I couldn't give birth anymore. A fibroid damaged my womb. It was by sheer luck that Brian survived. Brian was indeed the apple of both our eyes. That was the reason it pricked me that growing up, the child won't remember his father who loved him so dearly. Mama! His voice rang again from the sitting room where he called, and another smile tugged at my lips. If only for him, I had to put my grieving aside today and live as both Brian's father and mother. I was willing to step into Steve's shoes along with mine for my son. I completed the packing, loaded the baskets, and started to transport them into the car. As I walked past Brian where he played with toys, he looked up and gave me a cute boyish grin. I smiled back at him and continued outside towards the car. From the moment I jammed the boot in place, a strange feeling overwhelmed me. It felt like I was pushed by some force, but I raced back into the house and I understood the feeling that came over me. Brian was gone and the house was still. Weird. Brian? I called multiple times as I checked through the house in search of my baby boy. I went to the kitchen, the toilets, the bathroom, and every single room in the house. I checked the refrigerator, the freezer, the dishwasher, the oven, and the washing machine. I even check absurd places, places Brian would never fit in like under the chair, behind the television, under the stereo. My brain turned in my head. I went back into the room and checked under the bed, inside the wardrobes, and behind the curtain, and it all didn't make sense. Brian was here a minute ago. He couldn't just disappear into the air like a magician, could he? I called his name many times, chuckling like an idiot. You got me, boy. <laughs> now come out. <laughs> but my voice was echoing through the still house. I scratched my hand through my hair in frustration. My eyes were wet with tears. My head banged and my body was aching. After 15 full minutes of searching through the house to no avail, I called the neighbors. I went from door to door asking if anyone had seen Brian but they all looked at me like I was mad. I couldn't blame them. Steve and I never associated with any one of them. We were people you could describe as unfriendly, friendly neighbors. We didn't have anything to do with any one of them, but we never caused trouble either. Perhaps it was because of the hysterical way I looked that the people who saw me started to get worried, and one of the neighbors called the police to report my situation the way I narrated it to them. The police indeed arrived as families were setting off for picnics and my Brian was nowhere to be found. My stomach ached and my throat was hurt. I shouldn't have left him, I thought over and over. The police asked what the problem was and I narrated it to them. I thought it would be absurd to them as it was to me, but the policemen looked more worried than surprised, like they knew something I didn't. This time, I was the one to ask questions. What's wrong? Why are you looking at me like that? They asked me to tell them what happened again, and I did. I told them how I was by myself in the kitchen, preparing for the picnic with Brian. The sound of his voice that I heard while I was cooking. I told them about my husband's death and how I missed him dearly that morning. 
I skipped to the part where I picked up the picnic basket, smiled at Brian as I walked outside, and loaded the boot of my car. The way I entered back into the house and my son was gone, nowhere to be found. Since I was in a neighbor's house, the police officers led me back home and said they would search for my son with me. I thanked them and together we entered the house and they began searching the same way I did earlier. From the kitchen to the toilet, to the bathroom, to my room, and finally, Brian's room. I was waiting for them to be done and concluded my son wasn't there, but it was a different case. In the center of his room, my son was hung like one who committed suicide. His eyes, I was arrested for the murder of my son. No matter what I said, nobody believed me. I couldn't blame them. I was the last person to see him anyway, and there was no record of any person breaking into the house. I was charged to court and found guilty. They said I killed my son out of contempt and I was sent to prison. I was left alone to mourn both my child and my husband. Life was cruel. A year later, the murderer was caught. It was a similar case to mine and a thorough investigation was put through. A serial killer who took joy in hanging toddlers on the 4th of July was the culprit. I was released and the man was imprisoned. Isn't it weird? While people make merry and rejoice on Independence Day, I am filled with sorrow and rejoice at the loss of both my husband and child in such a short period of my life. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> it took exactly three minutes for me to go from being the most beautiful girl in the neighborhood to the ugliest lady anyone ever met. Anytime I looked in the mirror or people flashed back for a second look at me in astonishment, memories flooded through my mind and I almost felt like I would run mad sooner or later. It was a good thing that I always had my boyfriend with me. Without him, I'm sure I would have taken my life. A few years back, it didn't matter if people turned to take a second look at me. I relished in the joy that people enjoyed looking at my face, staring in disbelief at how beautiful I was. It made me proud of myself, and I flung my perfect skin and face for joy. It was no news that many people wanted to have some sort of relationship with me. Girls were jealous of me, and boys wanted me. Money, beauty, and brains were a hard combo for anyone to find. And I had it all. Nearly a dozen men asked me out every day, and going on dates was starting to irritate me. That was until I met Dan Fisher. I longed to go on a date with him. Maybe it was because of the competition. People rushed away from me to him, and for the first time, I saw a man whose style and beauty matched mine, and I knew I wanted him to be mine. The problem was, he didn't ask me out. He was never interested in me. My pride was hurt, my personality was affected, and eventually, my self-esteem would have shattered. But I couldn't give up just yet. I organized a party and invited the neighbors, Dan too. It was a good thing that I had rich parents. I was surprised when my mom told me that he accepted the invitation and his family too would be coming to the party. Of course, I didn't plan the party in my name. I made up some excuse and because my mom was so party inclined, it didn't take a lot of convincing for her to agree. It was all fine from the start. People gushing over our house and paintings and the beautiful interior decorations. My mom spent thousands of dollars every three months to change the look of the house. It was no wonder that everyone gasped every time they came there. Dan was one of the people to be wowed too. I saw when he entered and every one of his reactions. My eyes were on him the whole time. It was his first time in our house anyway. One would have thought that my house would do enough convincing in the heart of Dan Fisher to long after me, but that wasn't the case. He still didn't want me. 
I knew because he ignored all my advances and even the nice little comments I made when I passed by on his side on purpose. The more he ignored me, the more I wanted to know what he wanted. So I set a trap. I asked my best friend Mia to speak with Dan and know about his preferences. She did as I asked and went ahead to ask Dan about his preferences and why he didn't want me. The answer Mia brought back caught me off guard. Dan said he didn't make any advances because I was too pretty. It made no sense and none of it added up. But I wasn't thinking logically about it. I was thinking about having Dan Fisher. It was at that moment that a little plan began to form in my head. A way for me to become less pretty and lovable by Dan. Suddenly, it didn't matter if I was a little less beautiful. As long as I got Dan. I took an excuse and instructed Mia to send Dan to the kitchen exactly three minutes from that time. She nodded and I disappeared into the kitchen, ready to carry out my plan. I turned on the gas and the electric cooker. The smell of gas saturated the air and I could almost hear the clock tick. At the exact time I wanted, Dan entered the kitchen looking at me with strange eyes. A couple of seconds later, fire exploded in the kitchen and caught my face. More out of impulse than care, Dan rushed to me to try to get me out of the fire. I lost consciousness, but when I woke up a few hours later, the situation ended up exactly the way I imagined it would. Dan Fisher was arrested for my attempted murder and arson. My face was half burnt, my beauty half gone. Now it was my turn to save Dan, the man of my dreams. I pleaded with my parents to let him go and blame the fire on technicalities. They agreed after my many pleas. I told them that I would do the release myself. I loved my new look and refused plastic surgery no matter how much they begged me. I was the perfect type for Dan Fisher. I visited him in prison. You bitch! It was you! He shouted when he saw me grin. I nodded my head. Yes, you don't like pretty girls, right? Now, I'm perfect for you. I grinned hard, but my heart twisted in knots when a disgusted look filled his face. I don't want you. Your friend Mia? I lied to her. I love pretty girls with big eyes and boobs. Your heart was always ugly. Now your face is too, he said. I was shocked. And from that moment, I didn't want him anymore. I hated him as much as I loved him. I released him from prison as I planned to from the start, but that was after he signed a contract to be my boyfriend for the rest of his life. The contract was his only way to stay out of prison, and I knew he would definitely honor it. The relationship felt awkward at first. He didn't love me and I didn't love him. We weren't the ideal couple I fantasized that we would be because now I was ugly. People gave us second looks on our forced dates, but it wasn't because we looked so beautiful together. It was because a beautiful man like Dan had an ugly girlfriend like me. My whole sacrifice was for nothing. This is not what I wanted. I started hating every part of me. Then, I committed every day of my life to making myself uglier. I tore my skin with a blade and gave myself more scars. I tried to be as ugly as possible. I added a clause to the contract between Dan and myself that made it compulsory for us to go on a walk whenever I wanted to. I longed to see how people looked at Dan more than how they looked at me. The look on people's faces when they see me might be traumatizing, but it was not as satisfying as the look on their face when they would stare at Dan in pity. My new face might be my stigma, but I was his stigma for life, a punishment for playing with my heart. A 
A cool breeze slipped into my room through the bars. I must have a visitor, and the wind, as tiny and unnoticeable as it was, had not gone unnoticed by me. Being in prison for a few years meant I had nothing to do except to follow up on some patterns. I sighed and let my mind carry me back to the past. In my house, one that I could still remember, cold wind slipped through the window and filled the room. It was not the slight wind like the hellhole I was in now, but one of freedom. I smirked with delight as its tiny hands caressed my skin. Immediately, my eyes opened, but I refused to get out of bed still. It had been a while, I thought to myself. On regular days, I would be dragged out of my sleep by the alarm clock beside my bed, but not that particular day. That morning was indeed a good one. It was July 4th, for God's sake. I could stay home all day without going to work if I wanted to. I took three breaths, closed my eyes, and opened them again. Then, I just sat there on the bed, staring into space with no thought in my head. I looked at a picture of Rachel and me that stood on the table right next to the bed, and I smiled. Rachel was the best thing that happened to me after the divorce I went through two years ago with my ex-wife. At the time, I was a complete mess. I totally gave up on love, but Rachel held my hand and led me out of the dark and into the light. I would have asked her to marry me already, but marriage was something I was still a little scared of. Though she was an angel, the total opposite of my ex-wife, I still had some fears. She could be here any minute, I thought to myself as I smiled from ear to ear, like a child playing in solitude with his toys. <laughs> Maybe I was a child after all, her child, because that was the kind of love she gave me. Eventually, I got out of bed and walked to the window. I moved the curtains aside in a bid to get a view of what it looked like outside, but my eyes were forced closed by the angry rays of sun that met them. The sun was already at the middle of the sky. It was almost noon, I realized. The streets were unusually filled with people, and they seemed happy too. Most of them didn't seem to be in a hurry to get to a certain destination, as opposed to the other regular days. I got into the kitchen, made breakfast for two, then took mine out of the kitchen and into the living room and ate it there, while I rewatched Doctor Strange's Multiverse of Madness. Wanda surely kicked some ass in that one. As soon as I was done eating, I turned on some music while I danced in according to my best. I slumped into the chair out of exhaustion and laughed lightly. I could not think of anything else to do, but that was when I remembered Rachel again. What could be keeping her? I asked myself. She was not the one to show up late. The day wouldn't be so much fun if I spent it without the love of my life. Quickly, I picked up my phone and gave her a call. Her phone rang multiple times, but she wasn't taking any of them. About 20 minutes later, my phone buzzed. Baby, I will see you at night. It was Rachel. I immediately knew what it was about. There was probably an emergency at the hospital she worked at. Otherwise, she would have been here already. It was something I had already planned. A few days ago, we made preparations and plans to spend the entire day together. For a minute, I felt a little disappointed, but I simply pushed my feelings aside. Finally, I decided to take a stroll around the street, or maybe I'll go to the park to pass some time while I wait for Rachel. I rushed into the bathroom, had a quick shower, and threw on something casual. I hummed a song as I walked towards the door, but mysteriously, I heard something strange. A sound of something shattering. I ignored the sound at first, but I heard it again. Then, there was silence. I stood still for about a minute, waiting to hear the sound again. Then, I heard footsteps. Who's there? I asked. But there was no response. I couldn't figure out where the strange noise was coming from. Then... I heard the crackling sound of a door open. 
That's when I realized that it was all happening in the basement. I rushed back into my room and carried the baseball bat that I had lying under my bed for as long as I can remember. It was for days just like this. On my way to the basement, I dialed 911. I told them that there had been a break into my house, but I still proceeded to the basement. As soon as I got in, the door shut itself. Instantly, fear gripped me. I espied a shadow running behind me, but when I turned around, it was gone. Who's there? Show yourself! I screamed, fear creeping into my voice and causing it to tremble. The basement was really dark, so I could barely see clearly. I rushed towards the switch and attempted to turn the lights on, but they wouldn't come on. Apparently, they'd been tampered with. I slipped my hand into my back pocket and brought out my phone. I tried to turn on the flashlight, but something struck it out of my hand immediately. Terrified, I rushed back to the door of the basement, but it was still locked. While I was trying to break down the door, a dark figure rushed at me, priming at death or maybe something worse. Scared to the bone, I swung my baseball bat wildly and didn't hit the invader. I swung it again, and this time, it connected with someone. There was a sick sound of bones being crushed, skull bones giving in, and a gasp. I hit two more times and watched the shadow fall to the ground. I stood where I was, about to piss my pants. What the hell was that? The shadow made a gurgling sound, like it was trying to talk. I picked up my phone from where it had fallen, turned it on, and froze. It was Rachel. She was trying to speak, but her head was knocked open, blood dribbling out of it. Too much blood. Fuck! I screamed, realizing that now she must have been trying to prank me. I ran towards her, but her eyes were already getting shut. I'm sorry. I wailed. While I held her in my basement weeping, I heard the door open. The police were here. I leaned back against the prison wall. Throughout my trial, I had been so numb to say anything. I deserved it. I deserved this place. Still, the irony was not lost on me. The irony of losing my freedom on Independence Day. <laughs>